Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 139, featuring part two of my interview with David Fox. In this part of the interview, we continue discussing the early days at Lucasfilm Games and Coronas Rift and Maniac Mansion. We also talk about piracy and the tactics that Lucasfilm took to address the problem. And then we start to talk about uh, David's most famous game, Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. A lot of great stuff, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Fox. All right, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this uh, the setup for programming these games. I was uh, reading that there was a Unix uh, system that the actual coding was done on, and then that was uh, ported later to uh, the Commodore and Atari and all, all the rest. Can you sort of uh, describe that situation a little bit? Well, we, we ended up, because Peter's background was uh, you know pretty much Unix, and I think it's the computers division's background was that, and we already had a bunch of VAX Unix uh, computers, you know, running uh, was probably you know Berkeley Unix. Um, the idea was, and, and at the time, that the tool, the computers weren't that powerful, so it was really hard to get a really good compiler or cross assembler or whatever on those target machines. So we ended up um, writing our own cross assembler first. Um, I think it was written in Lisp. So we were actually coding on. A, on a terminal, a CRT, um, in Emacs as the the editor, writing Lisp code, um, which was essentially a, a, an assembler program. And then you push a button, it would compile it down to um, to the binary to assembly, and we there was a serial connection to the target computer. Um, it would download it over a serial port to the target computer and boot up, and there's a, then you get to test it. So it, what you know wasn't terribly difficult. You know, there was you know this lag where you make a change and you run it down, and, you, and there wasn't a whole lot of really great debugging at the time early on. But um, eventually, we ended up with um, you know Sun microcomputers and our as our desktop computers, and we would rather than having a separate Unix machine, we'd just do it right there download it from the sun directly to our target computers. I think on the when we did Commodore 64 work, we ended up with a routine which would download it to a to a floppy disk that was attached to the Commodore. The Commodore then you'd boot up off the floppy to play the game. Um, with Atari, I think it was directly into into RAM. Um, of course, when we went to PCs, then you didn't have to do that anymore because they were then powerful enough to have their own uh, you know, code. In fact, then we were using Scum um, for graphic adventures. By the time that happened, same thing for uh, the Sun on the Sun systems. We were that's also we were using, you know, the Scum environment um, rather than assembly at that point. Did you have a preference for the Commodore machines or the Atari machines? Uh, I was always a, a fan of the Atari machines, and um, you know, partly because I started with that. I, I wrote a book on. On, I, I knew the system much better. Um, I thought it was a better computer, um, and I was really disappointed when when um, Commodore sixty four became much more of a standard than the Atari was. So is yes, that the, talking about the the sixty four versus the like the Atari eight hundreds? Are you talking about the Amiga versus the ST? No, I'm talking about the the pre Tremio days. Um, so the um, Atari eight hundred versus the Commodore sixty four. Uh, what about uh, I wasn't sure what kind of involvement you had with the uh, Coronas Rift, or even if that's the right pronunciation of it. I yeah, <laughs> don't uh, think I've ever heard the word pronounced. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, probably none. Um, at the time, let's see. There after the first two games, we had two two other games that were also used fractals. So they, they took the rescue on Fractalus Fractal code and then enhanced it. Um, one was Coronas Rift that Noah Falstein designed. The other was the Eidolon, which Charlie Kellner designed and project led. Both of them were project leaders too. In fact, that was the way it was at Lucas pretty much the whole time I was there that the project leader 
was also a coder and the lead designer and essentially producer. Um, so they, that one person kind of wore, wore all, the, all the hats for, for those different areas. Um, and I think I must have been in conversion hell at the time. I was, you know, you, you do a game and then for the next year or two, you're, you're stuck having to supervise or work with people who are converting to other platforms. Um, there were no translations, I remember, but they definitely had to convert to all these European platforms, you know, besides the Apple II and the Commodore 64 conversions, there was like Spectrum and the Amstrad and the, and I think there were two or three other ones they got converted to. And, you know, that was really tedious. I mean, I didn't have to do the coding myself, but it was just managing it and having to deal with all that. Um, I'd much rather be onto a different project. I think it's fun that you referred to it as conversion to hell. Yeah. <laughs> we're, just, we're having a discussion over at Armchair Arcade about, you know, when, when you make a port to a different platform, is that a creative process in and of itself, or is it just, like you say, just raw tedium? And Well, it, it's a creative process, but more often than not, it's also a, a lot and a lot of um, your your a lot of compromises. A lot of places where you where you realize that the original platform, where you, you know we really targeted for the Atari eight hundred, and took advantage of a lot of features that it had that other platforms didn't, including the Commodore sixty four. Um, so you're kind of in most cases you were stuck with a version which, while really good, was you know, just because the Commodore 64 has had a slower CPU than the Atari 800 by by almost what it was like one megahertz versus 1.6 something megahertz. So so Atari's was like 60 percent faster. So that means you're going to get faster frame rates just from raw CPU power. So you end up with a you know instead of six frames per second, it might be closer to four, which changes the whole way the game feels. Um, a bunch of other little compromises here and there, you know, made the game not quite. The sound was really good, but a bunch of other things weren't as good. And when you go to some of the other platforms where you didn't even have the Commodore 64 capabilities, like the Apple II at the time, or the Spectrum, you know, Sinclair or other computers, it was like, oh god, this is this is not my game. It's like taking your baby and and dressing him up in in rags or something. <laughs> they did a, they did a miraculous job given what they had to work with, the guys that worked on this. Um, they were mostly either contractors or companies um, in Europe that were licensed to do that for us. Um, so they did the best they could do with what they were what they had to work with. But it was always painful just to have to say, okay, we'll get rid of that. You know, okay, I realize you can't get up to the frame rate. Can we do anything else again? Let's make the screen smaller maybe. You know, what else can we do to get the frame rate up? Uh, pain aside, do you think there were any advantages to having uh, so many platforms, or do you like you think we're better off now with uh, fewer uh, platforms? Uh, I think we're better off with fewer. I mean, th there is when once we had even just for the for the PCs. I remember you know this is like another generation when we were doing the adventure games that there were. Uh, just getting the first version out there where it had to support, you know, various resolution graphic modes, you know, the ones that had CGA and EGA and VGA and, um, you know, five different sound cards and what if they don't have a sound card and what if they have a slower CPU than the other ones and all these things you had to check and let it degrade gracefully to work on all of them. Um, but that was also not the fun part. I mean, for me, the fun part is designing and implementing the, the original game, not all the other versions of it. You know, I want the best one only. I mean, if it, that's kind of what, you know, I guess we're, we're going to always have that to some degree, even with iOS, you know, as you end up with faster and faster CPUs on the, on the generations of iPhones and iPads and whatever. Um, while the code might be the same, you're still going to, if you design something for the, for say a new, upcoming iPad 3, you say it has a faster CPU, will it still work okay on the iPad, the first iPad? So, I don't know if we're, I don't think we'll ever get away from that. Uh, what about the, you know, moving into adventure games, 
I was uh, before we get into the obvious, you know, <laughs> Zach McCracken. I wanted to, to mention a labyrinth. You know, I was wondering if you had worked on that. Uh, for me, that's a really interesting a sort of experiment with interfaces and sort of you can see where the sort of the genesis there, what would come later. Uh, what was your involvement with that? Um, I was the um, project lead and I guess lead designer. I, I ended up kind of sharing a bunch of stuff with Charlie Counter, who was the technical designer, the technical lead on it. Um, we ended up, you know, that, there were parts of that project that were really fun and parts that weren't. Um, that was one of the first games, I think it might have been the first game we did that was based on a license, even though it was, um, it was a Lucasfilm production, the movie. Um, but it was, it meant that it wasn't going to be original from scratch content. So we had to base it on something that existed. So that frees you up in some ways and also restricts you, obviously. Um, we got to go to London for a week, um, the core team and spent a week brainstorming with um, Douglas Adams and uh, Christopher Cerf, who is um, a CTW, Children's Television Workshop guy, who also was you know, really close friends with Jim Henson, who was the you know, director of the film, and you know, several of our people. Um, and that was amazing. So I was you know, basically taking notes and participating in the brainstorming and came up with, he had a lot of really interesting ideas. That, it was my job to take all those when we came back and figure out what worked and what didn't work, how to take all those ideas and, and filter them through and turn them into a game design. Um, what kind of ideas are we talking about here? Uh, well, I don't remember the ones we tossed. Um, there, when you have some uh, really funny uh, people in the room with, with wit way beyond my own, um, you know, sometimes I felt like I was hanging on by my fingernails following the conversations, like the back and forth and the, and the, and the jokes. Um, but uh, there, I, I think one of the ideas, which I don't know whether we should have kept was, I remember it was Douglas Adams, which was the idea, you know, kind of a, a, a nod to the Wizard of Oz, where in the Wizard of Oz TV, a movie, you know, it starts off in black and white and, when you end up in Oz, everything is full color, you know, technicolor. And we thought, well, what if we start off as a text adventure, which is the equivalent of black and white. And once you enter the world, it becomes a full color um, animated graphic adventure. And we did that. And um, it did give people some experience with the user interface. We had this kind of, we call it, I call it a slot machine interface that we came up with. Um, where you had your verbs and your your um, your adjective, your, the, your nouns you had to act on would be like these vertically scrolling wheels, very much like I guess on an iPhone, the date changer um, uh, object that you have. And um, but I think we probably went overboard. It was too long. It became I thought it was tedious. After in retrospect, they forced people to do a text adventure for for this, and you're 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 advertising this as a graphic adventure. I wonder how many people bought the game, you know, gave up after, said, what, I thought this is graphic and it's a text adventure and, and, and they stopped before they ever got to it. So it sounded really fun and, and I think it was probably when we could have said, no, I don't think that's going to be as fun for the, for the user. I, I thought it was brilliant. You're talking about the starting off as a text game and then becoming. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant. You mean people didn't didn't like that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I hated it after a while because I was playtesting all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't know whether people, if there are any, any people who actually gave up on the game or got pissed at the game because, you know, we were we started off in the old, the old type of gaming system. Rather than going I believe the first, the first graphic you see isn't it of uh, David Bowie? <laughs> well, what, you, you, I think you've, you finally win the text adventure. You end up going into a movie theater playing Labyrinth, and what's playing? You know, you see David Bowie on the screen, and he says, "Come on in," essentially, and you, you kind of move into the screen, and you're now part of the of his universe on the other side of the movie screen, inside the game. That you know, was kind of clever, but it was, uh, <laughs> I would have changed. Oh. What about the uh, project Habitat? Um, I wasn't involved at all in that one. That was um, Randy Farmer, Chip Morningstar, and Eric Wilmander. And 
that was a pretty amazing experiment. I mean, trying to take a Commodore 64 with a 300 baud modem and, you know, do this multiplayer, massive, massively multiplayer environment. And it worked. It did work. And I think they ended up crashing the servers because there were so many people using it at the same time. But I think they must have killed the project. I believe this was Quantum Link was the company which was the forerunner to AOL. And uh, they took that knowledge and ended up using it in other places. And Randy and Chip did especially. Um, and got a huge amount of experience of how to do multiplayer shared environments by doing that, virtual environments. But I thought it was brilliant. It was, you know, before its time, for sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, I see it brought up all the time in, like, the his histories of games in an academic context. But I guess it was a big hit with a lot of academics, right? Yeah, it could be. All right, so let's move on to the game I'm sure everybody wants to hear about. <laughs> Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. Uh, this is 1988. And I, I just thought we'd start by, how did you uh, pitch this game? Or how did this... You know, the game even get the idea uh, come about. Well, probably have to go earlier to Maniac Mansion, um, which was the first Scum game, and that was designed by Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick. And Ron, I was between projects, I was pitching some games that didn't get um, picked up. Yeah, you know, I think we were pitching to. This is before we were self-publishing, so I think we were had to pitch to other companies that, to to fund these games. And. Ron said, hey, I have this game. Uh, it's, it's designed. Um, I think I, I need someone to help script it. Could you could you do it? Yeah, it probably wouldn't take me more than a month or two. And I said, sure, it sounds like fun. So I, I learned Scum. I was basically coding in Scum as they were building the back end. So it was kind of like you know working with a moving target. Um, I believe it was six months later that I got most of my part done and kind of said, okay, Ron, you finish it. I have to go off to do something else. But by having that experience, I got to learn the language, got to learn the system, um, and I knew that the next game I wanted to do would be uh, have, you know, build on top of what Ron did with Maniac Mansion. Uh, so... I was, you know, going back to what I told you earlier that the reason I ended up doing the computer center because I wanted to find games or do something which made a difference in people's lives. I was pretty much into kind of this new agey stuff. Um, and I said, well, is there some way where I could pull all of that new age thought and, and ideas into a comedy, into a game? And you know, just make it all real in that game. Um, I spent a, a few days brainstorming with a friend of the general manager of the games division, uh, which was his name, general manager was Steve Arnold, the, the guy, his friend was, it was uh, David Spangler. He was a uh, kind of a spiritualist and he was an author and he, um, I guess he was a psychic. Um, he, he definitely immersed in this whole thing, this whole new agey stuff in a, much more than I was. So we spent, and he had a great sense of humor. And we spent, a, we spent several days up at his house up in uh, near Seattle, where we came up with exhaustive lists of all the different elements we might be able to toss into the game. You know, everything from, you know, ancient alien civilizations to, you know, Stonehenge and, and the fact that uh, Mount Rainier, right near Seattle, was one of the first sightings of UFOs around 1947. And, um, you know, the idea of telepathy and teleportation and, you know, mind linking and everything we could figure out that, that was a, a catchword um, would you know, toss into the game in some way. And I came back, and again, I had the same, the same task I did after the labyrinth brainstorming, which was, how do I take you know these pages and pages of ideas and turn them into a cohesive game? And I did, And but the first version of the game you know, presented it to the other game designers and to the, the, the team. And you know, Ron, rightly so, asked for a meeting to go over this and his feeling was that it wasn't wacky enough, wasn't funny enough. You know, that I had a surface level of humor, but it wasn't deep enough. 
and we changed the character. The character's original name was Jason. He was originally a regular reporter, I think. Um, turned in, he became Zach McCracken, names he pulled out of a phone book. Um, he became um, a tabloid reporter, which opened it up to a whole, whole other level of wackiness. You know, so the idea that all these tabloid stories were real. Um, that I could throw in a whole bunch of more stuff, you know, like Elvis and the spaceship and everything else. Uh, and that was it. You know, it's pretty, you know, pretty much set. But then we didn't design it to the point where dialogue was written or anything. it was more like here are the different puzzles that we had to go through. Um, here, here's the flow of the game. And then myself and um, I couldn't do this by myself. Um, we had Matthew Kane. Uh, who is one of our sound guys, music music guys, uh, offered to help. And he became a co-scripter with me, and we ended up coding the game. And it, because you had a lot of leeway as you write the text and write the things, you, and you see the art as it comes up, you come up with new ideas, because you say, oh, well, I, I didn't know what that, let's do that with this piece of art. And, and it gets much more complicated, and you get to weave it together into different ways. So... Hey, that's the short story. And uh, put this on. So here we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For those who know the game. So it was uh, Ron Gilbert's idea then to go with the uh, the tabloids. I think it was. I don't know if it was Ron's idea or it was from that meeting for sure. Um, that we went in that direction. When you end up in a brainstorming with a, with like six or seven people, who knows? It's hard to tell who thought of what when. Especially with all the psychics in the room, too, right? <laughs> right. Uh, I, you know, one of my favorite things about the game is the uh, the newspaper that came with it, the uh, National Inquisitor. Right. You know, people, uh, you know, nowadays I just got a this a Kingdoms of Amalur game, and it had nothing in the box. <laughs> well, there, you know, there it, here's all two this purposes. Amazing stuff. Well, well, what one of the purposes was, you know, besides providing backstory and, and providing a bunch of hints. The other was as a piracy, piracy prevention. The idea that if you got the game without the included material, it'd be, you know, close to useless or much harder to play. And there's also um, in Zach, you're going from to different airports across the planet, and I think when you traveled out of out of country, you had to type in a special code, which was basically on a on this. Uh, visa sheet that you had. Um, it was a code sheet, you know, you had a, and it was printed on dark red paper that was close to impossible to Xerox, and that was a, a piracy prevention. And we, I mean, we were all very sensitive to piracy because our first two games were pirated, even before they were before they were published. Um, apparently, a, a preview version of the games Rescue and Ballblazer, before they had their final titles, even. Um, got leaked to the message boards. This is before the internet was public or was wide, widely used, so it was the BBSs at the time. And made popular and downloaded and, and you know, there's that famous Tim Schafer story where when he first came to interview for position of um, Scumlet, a scum program, beginning scum programmer. Scumlet. He, scumlet. He, I, I was... I was the person he interviewed with first, and I said, "Have you played any of our games?" He says, "Oh yeah, yeah, I, I really like uh, uh, Ball Blaster." And I said, "Ball Blaster," and he said, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a great game." He said, "Well, you realize that's the, the Ball Blaster is the pirated version of that Busted. game." Was, <laughs> Busted. <"Ooh." laughs> and he thought he he thought that he had totally blown the interview at that point. I was more ribbing him because I knew that. You know, I kind of wanted to see how he responded, but you know, it's kind of good. So I could use that to see when people, how they refer to the games, which ones they actually played. I'm trying to remember what I said. I think I said Ball Blazer. That's, that's correct. <laughs> Ball Blazer. Uh, yeah, no, even in the game, right? If you get this uh, wrong, then you get the speech from Zach. You know, yep. anti-piracy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this must have been a just an awful problem for you guys. I mean, yeah. And, what, and we, what is? Why do you think people pirate so much? Uh, you're, well, if someone breaks it, I mean, there's a challenge. If you, the more copy protection stuff you put into it, the more of a challenge it is for, you know, for a hacker to go in there and try to break the code. It becomes a metagame. 
Um, and then once they do, then it, you know, I guess part of the, the pride is to be able to post it and have other people download it. Um, I've pretty much, I think of, of the idea now that you, you, it's there to stay, so you figure out ways to, to live with it. Run with piracy now as expected. So you, a better solution would be to use it as a way to promote a game and get it wide, more widely spread across the universe, and then hopefully people will buy the, the add-ons or the upgrades or the expansion packs or the whatever it is. But yeah, I don't I was, know. Yeah. Even when I had uh, Jay Barnson on a few months ago as an independent guy, you know, just one guy that invested all his own money and everything, it's like not even a, a day after he releases it, it's on all those torrent sites. Yeah. You know, it just blows my mind. Uh, well, if you once you've had that experience of having something you've worked really hard on pirated like that, it, it changes your perspective uh, quite a bit. You know, think twice. Hopefully, you think twice before taking someone else's pirated stuff. How do you feel now about all the uh, you know, sort of abandonware and people uh, downloading games like Zach for free? I. Uh, well, that's fun for me now. I mean, what I love to see, of course, would be to have Lucas Lucas Arts decide to go back to some of the old games, uh, like they did with um, the Monkey Island games, and reimagine them, or you know, pop them back up again, or do sequels, or or whatever. Um, I think they were looking at going. They were going in that direction at one point a few years ago um, when they did the Monkey Island upgrades or conversions or, or reimaginings. Um, but I guess the cost was still pretty high and they, I think they must have gotten edict to go back to the Star Wars roots and, and stick with that and rather than doing adventures. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part three of my interview with Mr. Fox. A lot of great stuff coming up. We've just begun to scratch the surface of Zach McCracken. A lot of great content in there, so stay tuned. I know you guys are going to enjoy it. As always, I want to thank you if you have supported the show. Uh, last week I mentioned some equipment that I, I needed to improve my gameplay captures. You guys came through and I was able to order the equipment. It hasn't gotten here yet, but uh, when it does, hopefully I'll be able to apply it and get the uh, quality of my gameplay captures up quite significantly. I think you'll really appreciate that, and I really appreciate appreciate you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It really means a, a whole lot uh, to me, as well as the show, so thank you very much. Now, what about that Ale of the Week? Uh, let's see what we've got here. I uh, I saw this at the at the grocery store, actually. I've never seen this brand before, but this is a Voodoo Vator. It's got a really cool picture of a skull and a <laughs> with a feathered cap on it, so I'm not sure what that's all about. It's a Doppelbach high gravity lager, and it says it's uh, big, black, and sweet. <laughs> not quite sure what to make of that. Uh, it says it's 9.5% alcohol and 19.5 uh, Plato. Not really sure what that is, but it's got me in the mood to ask a lot more questions about this beer. Uh, 30 IBU. You know, I guess I'm not really up on my on my lager statistics, I don't really know what the hell that means either. And this is uh, brewed in Atwater Block Brewery in Detroit, Michigan. So it looks really interesting. I'm really uh, looking forward to this. So let's uh, get it open and see what she tastes like. Let me just pour her in here and we'll see what this beer is all about. All right, well, let's do a sniff test. Ah, very pleasant scent. Uh, Kind of a sweet. You can already you could smell some of that sort of chocolatey, coffee-like uh, uh, flavor that you get with these uh, darker beers, the Doppelbox. Smells good. You know, very pleasant. Let's uh, taste. Wow, that is very very smooth. Just uh, <laughs> it can't get smoother than that. A little bit of a chocolatey aftertaste. Actually, kind of reminds me of those uh, Yoo-Hoo's or Chocolate Soldiers, if you are familiar with those little. Uh, I guess those are soft drinks, but anyways, <laughs> my favorites, and uh, this reminds me of them quite a bit. Very, uh, you know, considering it's got all that alcohol, I don't really taste uh, taste the alcohol at all. 
very uh, smooth, kind of a main thing I'm tasting is that sort of chocolatey coffee taste. Uh, that's definitely a dominating. Uh, no real aftertaste. I mean, all around, uh, really good beer. I'd be quite happy. I think you <laughs> and I would be very happy with this uh, selection. Uh, so, you know, two thumbs up. It's really good beer. This is uh, Voodoo Vater uh, from Detroit. Atwood, uh, I mean, uh, Atwater, Atwater Block Brewery. So, if you see that lying around in your local ale and lager shop, you might want to pick it up. All right, I have a great quotation for you this week, and it comes from Jean Cactu. I actually looked up the pronunciation on that, so hopefully that's not too far off. And it goes something like this. <clears throat> Art produces ugly things that become more beautiful with time. Fashion, on the other hand, produces beautiful things that get ugly with time. See you guys next week. Oh, Mario. If only I could control everyone the way I control you. <laughs> hop, you little plumber. Hop, hop, hop.